Dr. Yusef Doucette. He was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, and has been a lifelong Californian, spending his late teens and 20s in the San Francisco Bay Area, attending college at St. Mary's College of California in Moraga, California, and then transferring to San Francisco State University, where he earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Black Studies. He is a member of the Joko Collective, which is a grassroots community education project. And you can check him out or check the Joko Collective out on Facebook. Brother Yusuf, Uhuru. Uhuru. And I can't, I, I cannot say what an honor it is to be, you know, sharing a program with with these kinds of veterans of our freedom movement. Um, Baba Mukasa and Mama Afia, and of course uh, the chairman. So you know, thank you, thank you for your work, and greetings to the coalition and anyone joining us right now. It was so important to hear that history from uh, folks who lived it and, and did that work. Because, uh, you know, part of this capture, right, part of this capture of, of our, our political action, part of this capture of our movement has been the capture of the story of the movement. Um, and, I, you know, I, I don't know, I, you know, we could speculate on what makes it necessary now. But these last several years, right, uh, the mainstream culture industry has been putting out uh, these films and and uh, mini series, right, streaming series that are are proposing to tell the story of our struggle, but they're only going to tell it in a way that makes the Democratic Party the hero and the ultimate goal, as as opposed to freedom on our own terms. So I, I really appreciate hearing from the actual participants in the freedom struggle about all the kinds of details and, and individuals and organizing that is not shared broadly and in fact is, uh, is erased from the record as much as possible. Some of y'all may have read or remember the um, uh, what was the you know George Orwell's 1984 and and this whole notion of sending things down the memory hole so you can retell the story right the um, and George Orwell himself I've learned what what was a a, a rat fink right? <laughs> was one of the ones um, you know telling power that they should watch um, Paul Robeson. Right. So uh, when George Orwell is, you know, is held up, right, as some kind of uh, um, exposer of, uh, you know, big brother and corporate power, that, that's not really the case. Right. He was a, um, a a tool of of empire and a tool of capital, despite his nominal socialism. One of the things, you know, I want to. Or well, let me say where I want to go next, right? Is thinking about the work that has just been described, um, uh, looking at the work of SNCC and other organizations on the ground at the time. They were pushing the the democratic limits of the system, and that's absolutely necessary because we know that we aren't going to vote ourselves to liberation. We aren't going to vote ourselves to freedom in that way. But the vote and the electoral system is a tool that we can use. One, for organizing. Two, to demonstrate the, the limits of the system. I want to focus, when we're looking at electoral politics, on the local. And really the extremely local. Because it's 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 at the local that often we can see uh, the, the uh, most direct benefits of that electoral organizing. And again, right, I just, we can't, we, we can't underestimate the lesson that we just heard and the importance of that, of organizing around electoral 
politics as a way of of um, organizing with the people, understanding what the working class, what the, how they see their issues. Because again, as it, as was pointed out, the people know the contradictions because the people live with the contradictions, even if they aren't always able to articulate them in a way that um you know that 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 power will uh, respect they articulate it in a way that they understand and and speak in the in uh the language that they understand and we understand because we are the people right and that's uh, we always need to remember that whether we need to be with the people because we are the people and not be captured uh, by uh, by the elites, as we have seen over and over again, as you know, politicians co uh, cosplay as revolutionaries and socialists when they are at every turn accommodating, right? Talking big about um, curtailing uh, the police. Uh, defunding the police or redistributing funds that go to the police, but then continue to vote um, for the bills that that um, continue to militarize the police. Or and and you know that I shouldn't even say it that way because the police are already militarized. But to make sure that they don't run out of out of um, you know the latest weaponry and talk and technology for surveillance and repression. So the local state office is important. Federal office is important. We need to put pressure on those folks, but we need to do so from outside of the the duopoly party system, where you know, as has already been mentioned, you feel like you have to be a Democrat. And if you're you're frustrated with the Democrat, then your only alternative is to become a Republican. And we're seeing some of that, right? Um, but you don't need to be either <laughs> in either one of these parties. You don't uh, if you're if you aren't in a grassroots party, a revolutionary party, a party like the African People's Socialist Party. You don't have to be in a party, and you don't have to be in the American Independent Party, which isn't independent, right? It's its own party. You can just uh, what is the the thing on the uh, voter registration? Um, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's either like you know, no, no party affiliation or something like that, right? Non committed, something like that. But I, you know, I don't want to confuse it with the uncommitted movement that's happening now, right? In this electoral campaign, so we can be independent of the party as voters. And we need to be looking at the kinds of, of offices that are available in the community, in our local areas, where we may be able to have the most immediate impact or where our, our candidates that are raised up by the people to represent the people can have the most impact. I'm thinking about things like, you know, the various water boards that we, you know, these aren't glamorous, you know, um, electoral positions, but they're absolutely critical. Things like water board. In a, I, I'm in Los Angeles. Occupied Tongva and Chumash land. It's the second largest school district, you know, in this settler colonial country. And so, you know, the, the politics of that school board can be kind of big. But there are these, you know, smaller boards, right, that are like advisory boards. Getting engaged in the lo in your local school's PTA. Um, uh, uh, being involved in the kind of recommendations that are sent to the school boards. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't run candidates for, you know, things like city council and um, and the school boards. And I myself worked on a, a local campaign, um, a, a, a revolutionary African brother running for LA city council, looking to unseat 
um, uh, you know, black petty bourgeois, former police officer, former uh, police chief of Los Angeles, city councilman, who did nothing but undermine, right, his council district, um, and his successors have done the same. So it's, the, the point is not to ignore those, but to also look at the, the extremely local, because we can have a, a real effect there. In Los Angeles, and I, and I believe there are analogs to this in other cities, and so the, the, this should be looked into. We have this system that's come up, uh, the, the, the neighborhood councils, um, and it's a, it's a much more direct form of democratic practice in the neighborhoods, not professional politicians, but local community members who get elected by the community to these neighborhood councils who can develop policy for the neighborhood, put pressure on these, these uh, city council persons and other city agencies um, and city offices, and more effectively resist capture, more effectively put pressure on the gentrifiers. And those politicians who are running for the bigger offices, the um, you know the city council, the 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 state legislature need to come to these neighborhood councils, and so there's a way. It's it they are a way to hold these these uh, captured politicians accountable, and to produce folks who will actually represent the community from the community to challenge these primarily Democratic Party politicians who may, again, arise from, from nominal grassroots organizations, but grassroots organizations that also demonstrate capture, right, by the the local Democratic Party, the state Democratic Party, um, the neoliberal um, ideologues, and their corporate partners. So it's important to investigate wherever you are. Is there something like a neighborhood council? What other positions? Dog catcher, water board member, oversight committees that have open positions or, or um, you know, take the time to find out what work they do and how that work can be, be useful to organizing and to the, our movement for total liberation. And then also the importance of voting down ballot, right? Whether or not people decide to, to vote for, for president. And both of these parties have selected their their representatives, right? I, I don't even know if, I mean, I assume there are still primaries going on, right? Because there are other things on, on ballots, but both Biden and Trump, they've already got enough of whatever they need to, to represent their parties in the November election. You ain't gotta vote for president, right? And and I know we're gonna be hearing about the uncommitted um uh, movement and particularly in response to the Democratic Party and its failures and indeed uh, more than fail. I don't even know if I should call it failure because actually it, they it might see it as their success in undermining black political life and capturing uh, black political life and the the uh, muting that revolutionary call. But there's the down ballot, right? The the down ballot. Um, elections are critically important for the local. And I, I recall, um, you know, Chairman, uh, Chairman O'Malley mentioning this in um, a previous uh, planning meeting for this uh, electoral school. Um, whoever knows who these judges are that are on these ballots? And those judges and prosecutors have uh, such a direct impact on our lives, right? The, the police, 
the prosecutors, the judges, the legislatures, right? All complicit in this, what is it? 30 years, 40 years of mass incarceration regime. So it matters who these judges are. What do we know about these judges? Are we putting forward revolutionary lawyers to run for these judgeships? Because the revolutionary lawyers do exist, right? Movement lawyers are still out there. They aren't showing up at news conferences when you know the latest brother or sister has been shot down in the street because they are in the movement doing the work. Maybe we need to start thinking about you know, uh, uh, promoting some of them to run for these judge positions. And if nothing else, just to make people conscious of who these judges are and the impact they're having. One other thing I wanna talk about in terms of, of, of that democratic, uh, um, pushing that democratic limit. And that's the, the proposition process, right? And here in California, we've got this proposition process where you really don't necessarily have to go through the political parties to get things on the ballot that can become law. Now, there, the proposition process, there it is imperfect. It can be undermined. Um, they will hold things up in court. But again, it's a, it is a process that um, can be used for organizing, for political education, and to demonstrate to the people the limits um, of the system, the limits of the of the democratic process as it's been organized and structured in this society. This this well, you know, in the tradition of their democratic models, right? Ancient Athens and ancient Rome. This top-down notion of democracy that ends up being anti-democratic instead of the, the grassroots up people's democracies that they work so hard 24 seven to suppress and we'll call it undemocratic. If for example, a country decides it's more democratic not to have political parties and factions, but a direct democracy of the people um, electing their, their, the representatives to the people's councils, different versions of, of electoral politics. That really brings me uh, to the end of my comments, right? I just, again, want to salute the veterans of our movement, cannot express the kind of gratitude that you all deserve. And again, encourage us to be thinking down ballot and local in, in this electoral process. Get on your neighborhood councils. You know, I don't I don't know the politics of New York. Are are the borough presidents captured, or is that, you know, do they represent an opportunity for some grassroots bottom-up um, organizing? And these little unglamorous, but critically important positions that folks can run for. Again, like being a, a commissioner on a water board. Think about how important that would be in a place like Benton Harbor or Flint, Michigan, or here in Southern California, really not just Southern California, the state of California, where we are in perpetual threat of drought And there are many neighborhoods and regions that don't get clean water, right? Um, people who are forced to live um, in what we call third world conditions, but really those are first world conditions because they are imposed on us wherever we are. So I'm gonna end it there. Thank you for giving me the time. Uh, again, I'm honored to share this panel with uh, the, the revolutionary folks on here, Uhuru. Uhuru, and thank you so very much, Brother Youssef. And I just want to uh, say, just to give people a little bit of an idea about the rest of the order, we're going to have two more people who are gonna be part of this 
panel discussion, and then um, we're going to go to Q&A. And people have been putting some excellent questions in the Q&A, so please continue to do that. And also, I just want to remind people who are in the St. Louis area, but we all should know this, as we are talking about the importance of owning our own narrative and knowing our history and telling our stories, please look up the Battle of Island Mound, which was a, was a major battle fought in the Civil War. The civil In the Civil War, African people, we freed ourselves, but our history has been whited out and eliminated. We are the reasons that chattel slavery ended. And one of a very significant battle happened with uh, soldiers that called themselves Fort Africa in the St. Louis area called the Battle of Island Mound. So please, I uh, looked that up, Uhuru. Our next presenter is going to be Brother uh, Paul Pumphrey. And hold on one moment as I pull 